Good morning. This is the curriculum committee. It is Tuesday, May 4th. Oh yeah, I was seeing all the Star Wars thing. <laughs> um, at 8.02, um, we'll just go around to introductions. Um, I'm Erin Dove, clerk on school board. Sherry Kalis, director of Pupil Services. Would you introduce who's attending virtually as well? Sure. We'll see who's going to Oh, they're all Hey, group. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, ladies. You go ahead, Sharon. I'll go get the Good morning. Good morning, ladies. Hi, I'm Lisa Pollen. I'm from Badger. Kevin Hyde, curriculum coordinator. Jennifer Boyer, curriculum instruction. Laura Jackson, assistant superintendent of teaching and learning. Erin Faust, WBBA coordinator. Tommy Schmidt, school board member. And Ted Wimmer, superintendent. Okay, so we have a couple items for discussion, and I know Laura, you and I have spoken. Two are short and one is more lengthy. So. Correct. <laughs> so um, just an update for the curriculum committee of the board on our summer school enrollment. Um, summer school enrollment was to go through May 1st and um, the um, uh, overall our numbers are down. So if we look at 2019 kind of as our baseline because that was a typical year for us, then last year uh, we flipped to virtual and the state allowed for last school year only our elementary to participate in virtual summer school. That's not typically allowed at all. And, um, and so for one year they put that waiver in for us. So we were able to do that last year. The, um, and then this summer, uh, 2021, we have put out our, our summer school program and we have less participation in some areas where we typically have two sections of reading and math, we have only one operating. Um, and some will be combining grade levels. Um, we, our, um, our enrichment courses are, um, pretty, are doing pretty well with the enrollment there. There are a few that we've canceled, but uh, we have pretty solid enrollment in enrichment classes. And at the high school level, normally we have our FIAD classes filling up rapidly and we have a significantly less amount of enrollment in our physical education classes for credit advancement at the high school level. Do you have numbers available? I do. And so I could give them to you by course. Um, no, I'm just curious. You, um, you mentioned 2019 as a baseline. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what that quantity was compared with um, what's enrollment is so far, or it's closed, right? As of May 1st, you said? Correct. Um, and so we, we have the numbers then for 2021, and, and we'll just. Right. So credit advancement classes, um, credit recovery classes will be, um, will be registering. If credit recovery is if you fail a semester, mm -hmm. you can. Um, complete what and redo what you've failed. Okay. And um, so, is it possible because, to pull that out of the 2019 number then, so we can compare apples to apples? We are about 50 percent um, less as a K-12 summer school program. 50 percent of 2019. Correct. So half. About half. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and um, credit recovery we won't know till after this semester ends because okay. kids are still working yeah. really hard yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's <laughs> going for that strong finish yes good so okay. we're, we're down about 50 percent okay. long-term impact of that is um, our summer school enrollment on a three-year rolling average um, that three-year rolling average it uh, impacts our state funding and so the numbers stay with you for three years, whether it's a high number or a lower number. So we'll, um, as we, we have um, worked to, uh, on, on some of our summer school curriculum, just a couple of pieces of that, as we talked about previously, we will continue to work on that for next year and really um, develop a, a robust program and, I, um, and uh, hopefully bring that number back up for that again, ongoing three-year average. So you talked about the enrichment classes doing all right, but that the reading and math is down? Yeah, we have canceled a few of the enrichment classes. So um, when we only had one or two, we knew we weren't going to get enough to run the section. So we ended up closing those out. And reading and math, we normally run two sections at each grade level through seventh grade of reading and two sections of math. And in some grade levels, we'll be able to combine that. That's really more at the 4-7 level, um, uh, with, I think, the exception of second grade. Okay. So I, and maybe I'm wrong in assuming this, but I feel like a lot of kids are behind because of 2020, um, you know, the closing last year, and then trying to play catch-up this year. So it kind of surprises me that there aren't bigger numbers in reading and math in trying to get those kids caught up. So um, at the, that, that really is dependent upon people signing up for the course and because you, we don't require summer school, it's an option. And um, uh, we've had it open, um, we followed, um, I think some people are just exhausted. That really takes us okay. into our next agenda yeah, item quite figure. well, actually. Yeah, I was it say, ties in really well with our next agenda. I think agenda. families are looking forward to a summer where they could maybe gather, see loved ones that they haven't seen for probably you know well over a year, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And that's taking a little bit of a priority for them, um, which I, I'm going to take it as a compliment in, in that they have trust in our teachers and our staff that will be able to work with their, their child that might be doing some things uh, this summer themselves as a family um, to offset that or keep the skills sharp for their kids. But I think for families, that I think family time is just taking a priority right now. I guess that kind of makes sense. And maybe having, wanting the kids to have kind of a more normal mm -hmm. school environment and just taking a break for summer and yeah. crossing right. our fingers for fall. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of um, collaboration at the end of last school year to prep for this school year across grade levels, talking about um, what, what occurred after March 13th through the end of the school year so that the incoming grade level was uh, prepared to receive students and make any adjustments um, with the knowledge in advance of what kinds of adjustments they might need to make. And so um, as we look, you know, we've had school five days a week this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go into the um, plans for summer. Um, so our next agenda item is uh, plans for curriculum work and professional development over the summer. And these two, the, your question and this ties in really, really well. And, um, you know, we're not adjusting the school, the length of the school day. Um, and uh, we're not increasing the number of days that we're not going from uh, our typical length of a school year and increasing it to 200 days. So we're not getting more days with students. And so in order to uh, help actualize some unrealized potential that students have, that uh, maybe um, we want to like really bring that out and really reinforce some solid skills and um, advance their learning, we need to look at how we're spending the time we do have with them. And so in order to address how we're um, spending our time with our students and really capture all of that unrealized potential and maybe some of the, um, the 
uh, things that you're talking about, um, maybe that re-engagement um, with a school environment. And I won't say a return to the past, but the starting of a new normal in education and, um, coming this fall with all of the lessons we've learned along the way. So we've had lots of unexpected learning that has occurred over the last 18 months. And what are we gonna do with that? So this summer, we intend to talk with our administrators um, today and then share with staff opportunities to really come on in, spend time with us in sessions, um, looking ahead at next year and some of that unrealized potential focusing on how are we getting the information about what students know and can do and how are we using that information to guide our instruction. So we will have some professional development opportunities centered around that because we have to empower our staff to uh, really look at the class before them, the kids, and that um, assessment information to guide their instruction rather than um, this is the textbook we have um, and going from page one to page 1,000 in that textbook, uh, rather than just sticking to that plan, let's look at that unrealized potential and modify a little bit of what we do along the way. Um, so we'll offer some opportunities for staff to come in for professional development in the, that area and, for, I, and um, a lot of professional collaboration in that area. And it may be better to say collaboration because within that, um, opportunity to um, really uh, um, um, calibrate around some of these things. You grow a lot as a professional. Um, we'll also uh, do some training in July around the idea of um, our identity, diversity, equity, and inclusion of all students in our learning environments. And that again will help with that unrealized potential of our kids. Um, as far as curriculum work, we will be um, work, continuing to work on our social studies curriculum. Our world language will begin to lay out, um, so world language, health, and math will begin to lay out their program review this summer. Um, our ELA uh, K-12 will be working on units of study that will look a little different with K-8. They've started that work now, and then high school will begin some work in the, in the area of literacy this summer. Um, and then some individual courses are gonna continue uh, with curriculum work. If you recall, you um, previously approved the um, meteorology class for uh, an offering this year, so that'll be starting in fall. So just some more work around refining that course before that comes into play in fall. Um, the one other component of that of um, our summer work um, with uh, staff will have to do with our virtual program. If we rewind a little bit to July, June, really it was I think June and July of last year, we talked about a three-year plan to have an uh, be offering our own virtual program, and. Um, with the volume of students who entered virtual learning this year, we did, a, we did engage some of our staff in that um, within the Edmentum program utilizing that resource. Um, if you recall, our original plan was a three-year plan to get to the point where we were, had our own virtual program. Part of that is because the curriculum development process is much more detailed and much more involved than being able to create a very dynamic unit of study, a very dynamic um, uh, lesson plan. And um, the curricula development process has a lot of integration of learning and really looking at how that build over time, that build uh, um, within the content, that build within the development of the learner. And uh, it also looks across all subject areas and so the investment of time in that is quite extensive. So um, we will continue uh, to work on getting to the point where we're able to do that. So there will be some liter virtual professional development opportunities that people will be able to take advantage of that would like to engage in this ongoing process with us. And uh, so that in a few years, we have a solid West Bend product 
that we are able to deliver. Which, which people are you talking about? Teachers or parents or? Um, teachers. Okay. And um, yes, um, for our students for next year, We'll talk further at an upcoming board meeting and um, about um, working, continuing the work with our um, Wisconsin Virtual School Partnership. And so we'll talk more about that in much more detail at a future board meeting. Um, and our next item on the agenda is uh, our social emotional learning of our students. Uh, Sharon Kalis is our Director of Pupil Services and under her direction, um, our schools have been really looking closely over the last several years at the social emotional learning of our students. So we did a lot of, of training around um, trauma informed care, uh, really bringing the understanding and the topics up to the forefront for our staff so that we're looking at the whole child as we're providing instruction. Uh, Sharon is going to share some of our progress along the way and then hone in on, on three different components of our social emotional learning work. She has a whole team with her, some of them virtual, some of them present. So Sharon, would you uh, please sure. go ahead? The, our SEL team is a team Competencies are items that DPI has focused on and we have aligned them to what we have in our district and our instruction around that. The Carrie News and I started this process years ago and this is kind of like, I would call it the waterfall. Um, because we are aligned to the safe and orderly district goal and talking about the emotional and safety of our kiddos and how we support students and teachers in the emotional learning. We started this prior to COVID, of course, and so things have shifted and our priorities have changed about how and when we focus on social emotional learning. The other piece is, given last year the, the impact of um, creating virtual learning, our teachers were really busy with instruction, so we kind of put all of this on hold and most of it was optional last year. This year we're getting more into um, having everything based at each location and kind of dabbling in some of it. And then next year everything will go full, full bore at implementation at all of our sites. So if you look at some of these um, indicators on the bottom, we talk about the classroom instruction. A lot of that is done through our school counseling model. And we have physical and mental wellness, school safety, restorative practices, the continuous based database decision making, the PBIS, and then the wraparound services for our kiddos. And as you can imagine, we have different priorities at different levels and at different schools, depending upon our population and the needs of our kids. So this is kind of the big picture of what we do around SEL. This year for um, our SEL, we, we looked at two focus areas. One is the student focus and the other is the adult focus. The products that we have used to do this is Second Step, Purpose Trap, DESA, and then on the adult side, the EdCert. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these, and then I have my partners um, who are going to talk about how they implement it specifically at their locations. So if we start with SEL, this is where we are across the levels. And let me see. Alyssa and Holly, are you there? Yeah. Oh, excellent, it worked. <laughs> Can you give it your um, update about second step? Um, like Sharon had said, we have, over the last few years, done different portions of it, but this is the first year that every classroom, every student has completed the entire curriculum K through four. And it really has allowed us throughout our building for all staff to have for us as school counselors to tie in and extend the things that they are learning at the tier one or at that classroom level um, and really build up those skills of problem solving and empathy and um, having them be able 
able to share their feelings as part of that problem solving. Being able to name it and come up with solutions. Sharon, who was speaking there? Oh, okay, thank you. Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about second step? Sure. We've, um, we've used the second step implementation at Green Tree. I think it started about four years ago, and we really pushed on it for whole school implementation starting two years ago, at the beginning of last year. Um, same thing that Fair Park experienced, it really helped set the stage for some common language between students and teachers and helped us really plan out a rollout for the school of um, identifying and partnering some of the SEL skills that students need and have strengths in and also might need further support in when we can move them up to our tier two based on what we were seeing in our data. And one of the beauties of second step, I have kids that they're actually looking at, is all the lessons are already designed so the teachers don't have to create any lesson. Janet, I also have the principal toolkit here, and you are one of the people who really delved into that um, guide. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, the principal toolkit is really, really helpful. It lays out home links for parents, uh, assemblies, so we are just getting back into our assemblies, which is really cool. Um, helps guide that. It gives daily announcements. So our counselor really did a wonderful job last year of aligning the principal announcements with her in-class instruction and really trying to create that spoken sequence that was identifiable based on our needs. So it kind of helps keep it, push it, make it be alive in the school. It's kind of what we set our goals for. Um, students receive feedback in ways with our meter grants based on um, some of the skills that they're demonstrating for the week. So it really targets in on specific identifiers for students. The other thing about Second Step is they are very proactive. Um, they come out with new lessons and new products that are dependent upon our world. So shortly after um, COVID, they started creating lessons specifically designed to the behaviors of kiddos that you might see because of what was going on in the world. Um, and like I said, the lessons are all the, given to the teachers in K-5, and then 6 through 8 turns into a virtual model. So everything is available online and more interactive with kids using technology. So the beauty of second step is, one, the language is the same from kindergarten through eighth grade, so when you're talking about um, potential connection to deficits in, in second step, as the kids transfer from, like, fourth grade to fifth grade at Silverbrook, they would have the same language that the teachers are using for the instructional piece. And this is being taught by classroom teachers? Or? Yes. Okay. And um, Jennifer, how do they communicate with you about um, updates on, on the fly, so to speak? By the second step communicate with yeah. districts? Well, would they send us an alert, kind of? Like there's new, new lessons available, but more so people are checking it regularly because they know something could be happening in second step. So there's a digital platform in addition to... They do a lot of releases and the communication is great. I've called them quite a few times, especially when I was first starting. Um, they have wonderful webinars. They help just really direct and keep it, keep it very simple, user-friendly for staff and students. Holly, you were nodding. Did you want to add something? I, I was just saying, I think that that, or thinking, I think that that was super beneficial to our teachers, the webinars that they did, because I think um, last year when we, when everyone found out that we were fully going to implement it and not just kind of dabble in it, um, it was maybe a little scary to teachers. Yeah. Um, but the webinars are really and down to earth and put some comfort level that they have the skills to do it to um, um, be quick and easy to watch. So they were super beneficial. And, you know, I don't directly deliver it at all, but it was beneficial to me to watch them just to know so I can also use the same language and um, very effective. And there's puppets involved 
So the idea of explicitly teaching those life skills, those habits that um, further your learning, that further your opportunity is really the strong component of that. And then um, the, the individuals presenting, the classroom teacher is delivering it, but we have our counselors, our principals, and our school psychologists who also know and can use the same language, the same vocabulary, and support the lessons learned in the classroom so that those life skills, as you're, you were pointing out, can become embedded in what they do. And that idea of explicitly teaching that for students um, really supports all. It's one of those models of inclusive learning, to explicitly teach those and not just leave it to chance. I feel like you, you teach the kids that but then you just live it in your interaction uh -huh. with them in the classroom and they don't even know they're learning it. And the, uh, given that, Erin, um, the other thing we were able to do was buy literature that's aligned to the, to the competencies. And Alyssa or Erica, I'm not sure if you were able to put that into place with the books that were ordered. Have you been able to use any of those? <laughs> so they aligned, Second Step created, there's probably 25 um, leveled literacy books that we were able to purchase with our the Department of Justice grant that we had. So we were, I think we spent like $75,000 from that grant in buying um, sets of books for each site. And they are directly aligned to one of the competencies. So like if they're working on social awareness, there are books that they can use in their classrooms or in the, with the counselors to embed that in another learning opportunity. You know some adults that can use some of these. That's what I said. It's a life lesson. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, how you should treat people and yourself. 
I appreciate not leaving it to chance. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, our elementary so buddies have been doing this for a while. I assume you've all seen them. Yes. <laughs> and we started again with the virtual piece in grades five through eight. Um, up until this year, there wasn't a high school level um, series. They have since then, they're starting to create a, a high school version. But that takes us into our, our next um, product. It's called Purpose Prep. And that is um, second step for the high school, actually. And Janet Hadley, is she online? It does not appear to be. So. Janet Hadley is our at risk coordinator at the high school, and she was kind of piloting Purpose Prep this year. Very similar to second step, they all use the same language as far as the competencies. For her, it's helpful because the software platform that she uses is Edgenuity, and Purpose Prep is created by the same publishers. So again, if they're aligned to those categories and they're specific, she's been using specific lessons for students when something happens in their lives, and she's been assigning that to the kiddos. And really, um, it's favorable because again, it's connected to the academic um, venue that they're using. We are going to pilot some of this at the high school next year as Second Step comes out with their virtual platform. Donna Getz, the school site, is my go-to person, and Zach Daniels and Jared Kiesel from the administrative level. So we will see how that comes out. Um, how do you see that integrating into the high school? With um, right now it's on an individual basis, um, really looking at students with a deficit and then connecting them with some resources on how to fulfill that. Okay. I would love for it to be embedded in the school it's just a huge endeavor to, yeah. know, to do that. And you don't have a classroom teacher, you mm -hmm. have to figure out where that lives. Yeah. And then we also, then we're going to move to the DESA. Hey, Sharon. Yeah. Can I just interrupt real quick? Sure. Uh, in terms of second step two, like just we were just talking about the high school at the other end, the, our earliest learners, um, that's something that. They're starting to use second step in greater numbers also. Yes, yeah. start has already used it in the last couple of years. So it's helpful to our youngest learners so that when they come into kindergarten, they already have knowledge and, and of some of the terminology and some of the practices. And, and Emily has been working hard at trying to get it across all 4K as well as not just not just Head Start. So I just wanted to say that too, because that kind of is where we lay the foundation. And, um, focus has been on really building it up there as well. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. Um, as you know, Head Start's pretty involved, but now Second Step has created a preschool program. So Emily has been using that with her all K-4 throughout the history. We okay, additionally have gotten the resource. There are supplemental lessons on bully prevention that I know we've offered um, to our teachers kind of piloting this year. Um, but as they finish up with the 25 or 22, however many lessons are in the full curriculum, that's something that I've been offering or working with teachers to do as they wrap up the year. Yeah, that was a separate add-on to the second set of its own little curriculum, along with some of the uh, mandatory reporting kind of if kids feel like they are um, in unsafe situations or specific lessons targeted to potential mandatory reporting behaviors. Anything else for second step, ladies? We're moving on. All right, um, DESA is um, comparable to the STAR for math and reading. DESA is a product that um, evaluates the emotional well-being of the child, and Jen is in my superstar with DESA. So you have your own separate presentation. Jen, so you can go ahead. So I think the presentation was shared with people, so I'm not going to present it on the screen because otherwise I can't see everything or hear everything. Um, but really the nice thing that the, this is a great time for Dessa to fall into our laps. We're really practicing um, looking at behaviors, not in terms of good or bad, but as lady skills and trying to find really ways to build on students' strengths. So this was a great tool for that. It's really just an assessment suite of um, instructional resources that screen, assess, and teach social emotional skills. It is, there's two types of DESO that we use. We use the mini screener and the full screener this year. We created, we used our tier two, tier two team that's already existing and kind of expanded them out into an SEL committee. And we created a rollout plan for how we were going to try to embed this and populate it this 
here. So there's a little screenshot on um, slide four that shows like the start of our implementation. And throughout it, we really gathered resources from the teachers that were implementing it to see if it's going to be overwhelming if we tried it as a whole school, if it was going to be, if it's um, giving us appropriate information, if the information that it's delivering to us aligns with what we're seeing within our own school data. Um, the first mini screener was very easy. It's eight questions. It's aligned with the SEL strands. It's a very, very quick assessment that teachers give on their students. And I, mean, I would say probably within the first 30 to 45 weeks of school. Sorry, we have a bunch of kids in the background getting in their lockers right now, so it's kind of loud here. The screener they recommend that teachers are able to review the Um, this allows me as a school counselor to 
targeted interventions in the classroom based on those really specific strands. And then I use her, her strengths. So she's typical in, let's say, relationship skills. Let's find some relationships that are working for her and work on her social awareness skills. So to use her strengths to um, promote um, really bring the linking skills up to where we would expect a grade level student to be. And then this is just slide nine is just an example of little snapshots of what it looks like. And then slide 10 would show you where that child would fall on an individual to profile, where they, where they land. I believe that it is north amongst their classmates and it is north nationally. nationally as well. So it kind of gives a bigger, broader spectrum of that. Um, really, the DESA provides the data and resources to support all of these areas. If you look at slide 11, self-awareness, self-management, so on. Um, what's nice about this is that while maybe second step isn't as direct as like personal responsibility, it's very clear in their lessons where personal responsibility would fall or go back into reteaching. So when the teachers get these get this feedback for their class, they're really able to bring these in at more opportunities to give the students more um, awareness, more targeted practice with these skills so that they're getting that interaction with what they might need or building on the strengths of what they already have. Um, the biggest piece of feedback that we got throughout the year was that the level of resources that were provided to the team were the most helpful. So we just kind of did one little quick snapshot of some of the feedback from our team. What was the most helpful in preparing is that they had these webinars that the teachers could always go to, very quick ones, that talked through how to use it, to um, how to read the results of it, what to do with it, what to get it. And that seemed to really drive the team to feel very comfortable in their implementation of it. And then we just summed up the overall feedback from the team at the end of the arc cycle of using it. Um, they, these are the things that they really thought were strong about it. We didn't really get a lot of negative or um, concerning feedback about moving forward. Everybody on the team thinks that it's a great tool because we don't have anything like this to measure this. And we're teaching the second step curriculum, which is great. We're aligning that to our behavior data which is very helpful as well, but it's not necessarily strength-based when you look at it that way. And this is something that allows us to really build on the strengths that our students already have, and then to close some of the gaps that they do not come in with or need more intentional teaching on. Tony, did you have a question? Um, th this is fantastic. Um, I'm curious if parents receive a report on this and more you said you compared it to the star assessment and I know the parents really appreciate those updates is there a, um, is this formatted into a report so parents know how their kids are at school versus at home how have you shared and used the um, information gained about from the review of the uh, with the students with families so we just introduced early on that we were going to be doing this pilot, but it was not full school yet. So we haven't shared any of the results because we're still we were still using this year as a learning experience for how we created it. They do have different ways to share with parents. Um, I don't know. Uh, we haven't really gotten for like a school wide way of how we would look at doing this yet. Because she just did with seventh grade, and Lisa's going to give us an update about what they've done at Badger. Okay. And all this is part of the second select package. Well, it's connected. Oh, yeah. it's connected. Okay. Yeah, some of these are owned by the same company. So okay. those those eight icons that you saw, uh -huh. those are the same in every product. Okay. Those come from a company called Castle. Okay. So but when they're taking those assessments, um, that's a, it's easy to correlate back to yes. here mm -hmm. and where the teaching needs to happen. Or Correct. Is there a plan for, I know you said you haven't been sharing with parents yet, but have you, what, what's your vision on what that might look like? Or, Using the DESA? Yeah. Oh, I got lots of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> One of the areas that I really want to focus on is our children who are, are in special ed, and they've been identified as having a behavior emotional disorder. 
I would like to use the DESA from you know pre-K through high school because the language is the same. And then you can connect a, a deficit with instructional practices in either second step or purpose prep at the high school. Then for that child, you can also, from as they move from teacher to teacher, you can have those specific goals and you can use this as a progress monitoring tool, which we have not had ever. Would this, would you see this becoming part of an IEP or is that mm -hmm. even allowed by the DPI? I don't know. Oh, sure. Okay. So, I mean, we wouldn't say second step, we would say sure. we would be using the instructional you know, practices that are aligned with the social emotional competencies. I, I as, as someone who had a child with um, an IEP and mm -hmm. was not, didn't talk till he was four, so I. I didn't know from him, in his words, what was happening at school uh, with all these things. So um, I think this would be a really valuable tool for mm -hmm. communicating that to parents. Yeah, and Lisa will talk about that because there was a special ed teacher and a math teacher at Badger who did that so this year. So she'll be able to add some information to that. I mean, I totally agree with Connie, but um, what happens, I'm sure there's already a system for this because you guys are identifying these kids elsewhere through other means, mm -hmm. but when they're taking an assessment and um, they don't have the families, like you could send that home and the family does not care right. or does not know how to help the child mm -hmm. when you're looking at, especially probably the upper grades where you're maybe talking self-harm or things, you know, things like that. How, how is that addressed when the family is not there to support the child? Our responsibility is to the child, so we will always provide the best that we can in school. We will continue to work with families. We're trying to get some connections with Department of Human Services to come in and do some group, um, hold some groups for next school year, do more of that instructional piece with the kids. And you just have to keep families in, in, informed. I mean, they all want to be good parents, and if they don't necessarily have the knowledge or the skills, we will help them. Do you think that having DESA be more fully utilized will help you find those kids that are looking into that? Yes, because that mini, I mean, it takes like, I don't know how quickly you guys do it, but it's, you know, those seven, eight questions that you can do within a half hour, most of your kids in your class. And then the 72 um, item one would be um, you know, selected from your screener, from the mini screener. Well, I think these these second step um, things that the parents mm -hmm. women are that yeah. I mean that I mean parents want to be good parents or want to mm -hmm. know how or learn how mm -hmm. if they if they didn't have good role models when they were growing up. Um, I mean I think that supports that going forward also. Right. This is Sharon. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> There's lots of people to take my place. Um, anything else for DESA, ladies? No, and I don't know if we could actually do it yet because we just started announcements and it's uh, May the 4th be with you, so they were playing Star Wars music oh. in the background. I didn't hear a whole lot of those questions, but Sharon, it sounded like you answered a lot of them. I could hear your responses. Okay. So if you have any questions for us, just let us know. Uh, you might have to come up close to the mic though for the next like three minutes. <laughs> All right. The last thing I'm going to talk about then we've got Lisa, um, she's mall connected. We go to the adult focus area and that is the answer. And I have the examples here, but again, you're going to see these same um, labels. This booklet is the self-awareness booklet. And this is, um, we go through this and say it's really based on re teacher reflection. And then since you create your own strategies. I'm just gonna keep time. You create your own strategies around um, the implementation of these skills in the adult area. Like choose your own country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this the answer and the purpose prep from the high school are all the same company. Okay, this you can see that on the first page with mm -hmm. the same eight things. Yep. Okay. So Holly and Alyssa, if you want to talk about your implementation at Fair Park with the answer. Sure. Um, Tristan Hazel, Fair Park Principal. Um, I really felt strongly that he wanted us to pilot it this year with our staff. And 
the gist of it really is to increase social emotional learning knowledge and practices in our teachers so that they're better prepared um, to know them within themselves to teach them to our students. So um, Alyssa and I have been a really slow rollout <laughs> of it this year. Um, but I think that that's helped in the acceptance of it from staff and the participation in it from staff. So we have taken usually about a half hour, I think, of um, to 40 minutes of staff meetings. Um, where I think she just let you guys see one of the booklets. I think she said self-awareness booklet. We're, we would get that information, yeah, right there, out to um, staff through the week before and ask them. There's always like a self-reflection part at the beginning of it um, to kind of do that ahead of time. And then when we meet, we review and discuss like strengths and weaknesses and then go into the booklet's awesome. It gives lots of different activities to do with with um, the staff to, you know, if they identify an area that is something they want to work on, they you, you fill out that self-reflection checklist and then it ties it to different activities you can do to build up those skills in that area or your knowledge in that area. So we would just sample a couple of the different activities um, during our time with staff. Um, and I think we started just sort of describing activities, and then as we continued through the year, we actually had staff participate in them, which went over much better. Um, and I think that the staff really appreciated that. So there's eight different areas. We did, like I said, the slow rollout where we did the first four, which was self-awareness, self-management, um, social awareness, and relationships skills um, and so after that we actually had the staff fill out like a survey to give us feedback um, because we've had other schools kind of express interest in it how have you been doing it what have you found work what doesn't work so we sent out a, um, a survey to the staff which gave us good feedback just to say you know which areas were most beneficial which activities did we do that the staff really liked um, and I think it gave us really good feedback on um, just good reminders to all staff about being intentional in our modeling and our um, in our practices you know all the things we're teaching in second step <laughs> um, like modeling those out loud to kids was good um, the relationship piece really was good and encouraged people to kind of um, go outside their comfort zone and instead of just always being in grade levels or next to them in the hallway, like to do activities that kind of spread that out to build community amongst our staff. Um, so it was really good self-reflection and, and review and we got really good feedback from the staff on what we did. So we did the first four and then we'll do the next four next school year. Just wanted to add it, this year especially it really kind of brought people together and then there's such wealth of knowledge within each room of a building but to have people share the things that are really working for them or things they're really working on and somebody else type up and say oh why don't you try this or this works really well for me or someone else shared this with me um, and it really to have them be able to do a little self-reflecting prior, but minimal, but it wasn't a big task to read a few pages, to take basically five minutes um, to be prepared for the meeting. And everyone had something to share. It wasn't really super in-depth, but it was really helpful for their everyday um, and connected to the second step that we were asking them to do as well. Um, I think the other piece of it is it wasn't just the teaching staff. Um, it went to every adult in our building and we meet monthly with our aid staff as well. So they are able to um, not do as, just because of the time, as many of the activities with us, but they, um, we did have short discussions each month and they did receive all the supplies and um, anything we did not jam boards where people could put their ideas on things like that um, and so they had access to all the resources that were created from our discussions too. So every teacher actually gets these booklets 
so they're there to keep it. And the high school, I'm sorry, they're not here, but their leadership team went through the, the booklets this school year, and next year they're going to have every staff member complete the insert on a monthly basis. And they, they have found that it's almost better to do four booklets a year rather than all eight. Um, but they have been also a leader in um, implementation of the EDSERT and getting their teachers involved, which is a great thing for the high school to be the leader in this. So I'm going to let Lisa come up and talk about, she has us all connected with Badger ladies. Thank you for your time and you're welcome to stay on, but I know you guys are busy, so feel free to be part if you need to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let us know if you have any questions. For having me here. I am Lisa Paul and I work at Badger, so I was um, fortunate enough to be able to come present to you kind of what the SEL focus has been at Badger for this school year. So um, Badger decided to do a DESA pilot recognizing that obviously social emotional learning is imperative and we feel like particularly at that middle school level when you have hormones and social acceptance and all of those things going on. Um, so Kathy Mikowski, the school psychologist, and I sat down and talked about what a small DESA pilot might look like this year. We approached um, an eighth grade teacher who teaches math and one of our special education teachers who works with eighth grade students as well and asked if they would be willing to do a DESA pilot to which they both said yes. So um, those teachers spent the month that Jen had talked about observing students. And um, Jennifer Sternig is our special education teacher. So she created a template or a rubric based on the DESA mini to observe those eight competency areas in students and see where those things were lining up um, to give them a better idea of what they might see when they assessed students with the DESA. Um, we had our 8th grade math teacher choose one classroom and she did the DESA mini, which I think is seven questions for students. And then um, Jen Sternig, who is our special education teacher, chose a group of, I think it was seven of her students, and did the full DESA, which is the 72 question, because she knows that those students are students that have some struggles with social emotional learning based on IEP goals. Um, once we got the feedback on the mini DESA, the math teacher wanted to do the full DESA on, I believe it was five students. Um, really looking at optimistic thinking, that was the skill set that we found that was lower with our um, middle school students kind of across the board when Mrs. Sternig and Mrs. Linus had given that assessment. So she did do the full DESA with five students um, and then used those findings to focus on their practices. Um, I think there were some students, especially in the regular education classroom, that Ms. Linus had kind of expected. They seemed to struggle in this area and, and their results were higher than she thought and other students where she realized, oh my gosh, that optimistic thinking is really an issue for them. And I think for both of those teachers, it was really a mindset shift for them and an aha moment that when they don't have that optimistic thinking, the language that we use with them is super important and how we need to be positive and recurring the way that we think and the way that we say things to those students. And the math teacher noticed a big shift in those students that she had done the old DESA on where her change in language and her approach with them when they were struggling, it started to click for them. And I did have the opportunity to share with her that I had one of those students in my office and one of his celebrations that he shared with me is he started out the year with an F in math and he's now at a C plus and he was one of the students that she did give the full DESA to and realized that optimistic thinking was a struggle for him and just that change in her mindset and the language she used and how she approached him helped him be much more successful in her math class. 
So just in that short amount of time, they observed for the month of January, did the mini and full DESA in February, and then March um, utilized some of the materials. Um, and then I know our school counselor had kind of a student teacher who had worked with some of those regular education kids as well using some of the tier two supplies and materials. Um, when we had looked a little bit more into the materials that we have for the eight competency areas, we felt like a lot of those resources were better suited to elementary students. So something that we want to focus on as we move forward with DESA is seeing how we can use some of those materials or tweak them to develop that and have that be more age appropriate for those middle school seventh and eighth grade students. Um, for the following school year, since we had such a small pilot, what we had hoped to do in the fall is pick one or two houses that would pilot DESA from the beginning um, and then do a full rollout that semester and look at when you have those students that have areas that they need growth, might those be students that are tier two students that are getting um, some say group help, check in, check out, how we can use DESA to support not just our tier one students, but how that looks tier two and tier three. And also as a former special education teacher, um, I totally geeked out about DESA <laughs> because I'm like, oh my gosh, all of this information, now you have a way to measure, formally measure the students throughout the school year and then design your IEP goals around that. So I know our special education teachers were pretty excited about DESA as well. Um, the next thing that Badger had tried this year was Second Step. Um, and one of the important things was we wanted an all hands on deck approach. So not just classroom teachers were teaching it, but we had the supervisory aides, the special education paraprofessionals, um, the office staff were all assigned a classroom. So we had at least two adults in each room that were helping teach second step. And we rolled that out in October. Um, so we had altered our schedule on Tuesdays to give, I believe it was about 40 minute block to do second step lessons one time a week. Um, and then we did the everyone in and helping just because we wanted everyone at the school to be able to use that common language. We even had our head custodian, Mr. Lazowski, who for those of you who know him, is absolutely amazing with student relationships and he thought second step was the best thing ever. Um, we got through unit one and when we looked at staff capacity this year given uh, the pandemic, the fact that they were teaching in person and then designing some virtual lessons and Google Meets with students, we decided to put second step on hold for this year knowing that we were coming back to it next year. Um, so all of our teachers know that we're going to implement second step as part of that tier one approach in um, partnership with PBIS and that we're going to utilize that throughout the school year so we can get through all of the lessons like the elementary school has. Um, and it's been nice for me. I worked 13 years at the elementary level and now I'm at Badger. Just being able to tell the staff, I know you can't see how second step is going to build on things now, but I worked at Green Tree where we had started it four years ago, like Jen had said. And just seeing how far students had come with just that common language and understanding and how that will build at each level, I think will be super powerful for those intermediate um, middle school and high school teachers once we have kids that have come up the whole time doing second step. Um, and then we also decided as a student success team, which is um, the principal, assistant principal, myself, our school counselors, school psychologist, and PDIS liaison, to do a short pilot of Ed Cert for fourth quarter. So we looked at the self-awareness um, booklet and each of us took that self-awareness assessment and then identified our area that we wanted to work on growing in and then identified um, which activity we were gonna do. Um, so it was interesting, you know, kind of hearing where people found their weaknesses were and what activities they were going to do to improve that social awareness um, competency. We met weekly, we meet every Friday and kind of reviewed how things were going, what our plan was, um, and what action steps we needed to continue or change in order to meet our goals. Um, so we just finished kind of our 
pilot of self-awareness and we are going to be starting social awareness this final month of the school year and implementing some of that. Um, then the team is going to meet at the end of this year to talk about what we liked about EdCert, what we want to think about as we roll that out to staff next year. Um, we do plan to start that with staff and start with the self-awareness unit as suggested by Aperture at the beginning of next school year. So. That's what we have done at Badger this year as far as social and emotional learning. We've kind of dabbled in all of it. I didn't know if anyone had any questions. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing. I really appreciate it. And I um, like how the, the adaptation and the feedback you've gotten from people along the way. So thanks for sharing that. Cool. There you go. Sure. <laughs> Clearly, you know, we need to focus on the social emotional learning and you know, my goal would be to implement all of these, you know, pre-K through 12th grade. And we will get there, um, but I also want sites to be aware of the, um, the load of, you know, teacher capacity and do it, you know, how they see fit for their, for their staff and their teams. But like you've heard, it's also important to include everybody, every adult in the building, not just the teachers. Because you know, when you're in the lunchroom, kids gravitate towards our custodians and our you know other workers. Because so we need to make sure every adult has the information they need, and we're able to do that. It will just take some time. So any other questions? I'm just really excited about this, and thank you very much for oh, sure. for this. I think this is really going to help facilitate the educational, <laughs> that this is part of education. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I would second that. I, I love this. Okay. Any questions from the group? I'm excited once, I don't know, whatever it looks like, 10 years from now, when you're teaching this in elementary school, mm -hmm. if the teaching in the high school has to diminish yeah. because they've had it from the ground floor up. It's interesting to see. That, that's, that's the goal. <laughs> Probably, I would assume. Let's see that, yeah. If, yeah, and I, I think this this gives me hope that that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fact that they're all connected, um, just concept-wise, it makes flow so much easier. Yeah. The consistency. Same language. Yep. Yeah, it feels very seamless the way the adults can interact with each other based on what they learn is also how they can be talking to their kids. Right. And currently I'm able to use the Title IV funds, which is for safe and secure schools. So whatever the teachers need and building thing, we're able to easily, you know, get that for them. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Or yeah. <laughs> our last agenda item is our um, curriculum committee planning for future meetings. We have one meeting scheduled in June, and we do not have any scheduled beyond that. So, um, I feel like Nancy should be probably included in that discussion, and then also bigger picture if the curriculum committee is still the same people, yeah. and we haven't had that discussion yet. So maybe. Mm -hmm. We can table that. Um, I would, I think we need one in August. We'll be presenting a lot of things for approval if for, by the board in August. And so if that's still the, prior, the priority still to have the curriculum committee discuss it first, then we should have one in early August. Okay. And we can do that when that committee is formed. I think that's a good assumption. Um, in fact, if it's okay with you, um, I think we could... If you want to just tentatively say we'll continue with the first Tuesday of every month, um, but yeah, pending. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay. Okay. What happens at the next board meeting when we elect new officers and, and decide future board meetings? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't even have. Chris and I are finalizing the agenda for our next meeting and uh, committee assignments, calendars, keeping a consistency of committee work in that first week um, of the month. Those kinds of things are. Absolutely, on the agenda. Okay. okay. Um, then, can I ask, did the 8 o'clock time work well for the board members? It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
It, it, does it work well for the team here? Yeah, we love it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So we'll tentatively have the first Tuesday of August on, and then pending the other outcomes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, with July off. Oh yeah, we have July off. Yeah, we don't have one scheduled in July, and so I just okay. left that open. So June and then to August. Okay. All right, um, then we will adjourn at 9 o'clock. Thank you.